Part 1 You will hear a woman talking on the telephone to a man about a car he is selling. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, Brian Park speaking. Oh, hello. I'm calling about the advert in the paper. For the car? Uh, yes, the Mini you've got advertised for sale. Oh, yes. I just wanted to find out a bit more information. Of course. What would you like to know? It's my brother who's interested, actually, but he's not in today, so he asked me to call you. Fine. Great, thanks. So, it's a Mini? Yep. And how old is it? Just coming up to 13 years old. And I seem to remember from the ad that it's grey. That's it. Doesn't show the dirt. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, the colour shouldn't be a problem for Jeff. You know, the important thing is the quality. Yes, of course. And what about mileage? With it being pretty old, it's probably over 100,000? Actually, it's 40,000 less than that. 62,000 on the clock. Great. I remember now. I'm confusing it with another ad I was looking at. Right. Pleasant surprise, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been the only owner, or was there a previous one? I'm the second one. Before, it was owned by a teacher, who was a very careful driver, didn't have any accidents. Very good. And what about you? What do you tend to use it for? I haven't used it all that much, mostly for shopping. You know, this sort of thing. So, not much wear and tear. I'll make a note of that. I know Jeff wanted me to check that. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now, about the price, I see you've got it down as £1,250. I'm not sure Jeff will be able to come up with that amount. In the ad, I did say £1,250 or nearest offer. So, would you be prepared to go down to £1,000? That's really too low, I'm afraid. £1,100? I might be able to go to that. OK, I'll make a note of that. What about tax? Is it due soon? Got another five months before it's due. Oh, that's a real plus, yes. I'll make a note of that. OK. Now, you say it's in good condition. For its age, I'd say yes, definitely. It's just been serviced and there were no major problems. Major? I'd be able to show you the service report. The only thing is, you'd have to get a new tyre in the near future. Though it's still OK, you know. It's certainly absolutely safe at the moment. OK, fair enough. Yes, I understand. And the garage also mentioned that one headlight could probably do with replacing. They think there's a fault there, you know, intermittent... Well, we'd obviously look at all the documents, but that sounds very straightforward. Of course. I've got all the service documents up to date, and you can look at those. Well, it all sounds pretty good, and I know my brother will be interested. So, would it be possible for him to see the car? He's back from his trip tomorrow, and away tonight. So, how about tomorrow? Tomorrow? Wednesday? I'm, I'm afraid that's not possible. I'm out pretty much all day. 
Well, Thursday then? That'd be fine, yeah. In the morning? Yes, that'd suit me perfectly. Great. Now, you'll need my address. Oh, yes, of course. What is it? It's number 238. 238? London Road. Oh, that's easy enough. Yes, very straightforward. So I'll pass on these notes to Jeff, and he'll see you in a couple. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to a radio program on sleep deprivation. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. With us in the studio today are Dr Peter Collins, a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Chicago, and Helen Gardner, the author of the book Deep Sleep. They've come to our studio to discuss the effects of sleep deprivation, and also give some tips to the sleep-deprived on how to deal with the problem. Welcome to the studio, Helen and Peter. Now, Peter, what are the reasons for sleep deprivation, and how can it affect our lives? Well, the research into sleep deprivation started in the late 50s and has been going on ever since. Many researchers link sleep deprivation with electricity, television and computers, which have enabled humans to work 24-7. Before electricity was invented, people's body clocks were synchronised with the sun's schedule and the average time they spent sleeping was 8 to 9 hours a night. By 1975, that average was down to 7 hours and today one third of us sleep less than 6 hours a day. This leads to a condition called chronic sleep deprivation which basically means going for extended periods of time with less sleep than your body needs. Chronic sleep deprivation can cause a variety of physical and psychological problems. At its most basic level, loss of sleep can make us more irritable and less efficient and can affect long-term memory and concentration, which can result in more accidents. According to the latest research into sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation is the main reason for 3% of plane crashes, 10% of domestic accidents, 20% of accidents at work and 45% of all traffic accidents. Research into the physical effects of chronic sleep deprivation suggests more serious and significant long-term complications. Research from my university, the University of Chicago, has shown that sleep deprivation interferes with how the human body regulates insulin and sugar metabolism, which can increase the risk of diabetes. People who are sleep-deprived have weakened immune systems and are more prone to viruses and other kinds of infections. People who don't get enough sleep have cognitive problems or difficulties processing and assimilating new information. Lack of sleep affects long-term memory and slows down such abilities as judgment and reaction times. 
Some researchers link sleep deprivation with obesity, indicating that sleep disorders and eating disorders are often linked. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Helen, you've done a fair amount of research for your recent book on helping people deal with sleeping problems. Could you give our listeners some tips on managing their sleep? Well, if you spend several hours a night tossing and turning in bed, trying to fall asleep, you first have to find out how much sleep you need. To do so, you'll need to try and sleep six to nine hours a night. Set aside three days for the experiment. It's best to do it on a long weekend or a holiday to ensure it doesn't get interrupted. During the experiment, you should go to bed at the same time every night and give yourself six, seven, eight or nine hours of sleep. Then monitor the way you feel throughout the day to find out how many hours of sleep you need in order to feel your best. Once you find out how much sleep you need, you can work on improving the quality of your sleep. The main secret here is to allow yourself one or two hours to relax before going to bed. You may want to try and have a warm shower or bath before going to bed. Doing some quiet activities, such as reading or filing, can help some people relax. A warm drink in bed helps to induce sleepiness. Some people take up yoga or meditation to help them relax at night. Different techniques will work for different people, so it's best to experiment and find the one that suits you best. You should definitely avoid using technology before going to bed. Activities such as playing video games, watching TV and others which require you to use your attention can stop you from falling asleep. Avoid eating before going to bed. A late dinner can disrupt your sleep. Not only is going to bed with a heavy stomach bad for digestion and can make you overweight, but it can also keep you awake for hours. Caffeine-rich drinks can increase your heart rate, which can stop you from falling asleep. Energy drinks also have the same effect on your body. You should avoid drinking these at night. The same goes for vigorous physical exercise, such as weightlifting or working out on a treadmill. In many cases, you can reset your body clock and make it tick for you by changing your lifestyle. If your sleep deprivation is severe, it's always best to seek professional advice and get an appointment with your doctor, who might prescribe you sleeping pills. Thank you, Helen. We'll be back after the break and we'll be answering questions we've received from our listeners. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two conversations. Are based on the following conversation. The answer should be appropriate to the content of this conversation. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Oh, hi Dave. Long time no see. Hi Maria. I just settled down. I thought I'd drop by. Come on in, take a seat. Would you like anything to drink? I have Sprite and orange juice. Sprite would be fine. Oh, so how have you been? Oh, not bad. And you? Oh. I'm doing OK, but school has been really busy these days and I haven't had time to relax. By the way, what's your major? Hotel management. Well, what do you want to do once you graduate? Um, I haven't decided for sure, but I think I'd like to work for a hotel or travel agency in this area. How about you? Well, when I first started college, I wanted to major in French, but I realised I might have a hard time finding a job using the language, so I changed my major to computer science. With the right skills, landing a job in the computer industry shouldn't be too difficult. So, do you have a part-time job to support yourself through school? Well, fortunately for me, I received a four-year academic scholarship that pays for all of my tuition and books. Wow, that's great! Yeah, how about you? Are you working your way through school? Yeah, I work three times a week at a restaurant near campus. Oh, what do you do there? I'm a cook. How do you like your job? It's OK. The other workers are friendly and the pay isn't bad. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Several days later, Dave and Maria met on campus. So what do you want to do tomorrow? Well, let's look at this city guide here. Um, here's something interesting. Why don't we first visit the art museum in the morning? OK, I like that idea. And um, where do you want to have lunch? How about going to an Indian restaurant? The guide recommends one downtown, a few blocks from the museum. Now that sounds great. After that, what do you think about visiting the zoo? Well, it says here that there are some very unique animals not found anywhere else. Well, to tell the truth, I'm not really interested in going there. Yeah, why don't we go shopping instead? There are supposed to be some really nice places to pick up souvenirs. No, I don't think that's a good idea. We only have a few traveller's cheques left, and I only have $50 left in cash. No problem. We can use your credit card to pay for my clothes. Oh, no. I remember the last time you used my credit card for your purchases. Oh, well. Let's take the subway down to the seashore and walk along the beach. Now, that sounds like a wonderful plan. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello and welcome. My name's Carolyn Tan. Just as there are a great number of different courses and places to study here, the teaching methods used and the skills you need will vary, depending on the subject you study and the college or university you attend. All courses vary, but most include some of the teaching methods I'm going to talk about today. Generally speaking, in some subjects, you will have timetabled classes for most of the week. In others, you may only have a few hours timetabled and will be expected to work independently for a substantial amount of time. Working independently is crucial at university. I'm going to go over the three main types of teaching method you will have here. These are lectures, seminars and tutorials. There are other methods that you will come across, like workshops, group work and practical work, but I'll describe the three main types for now. I'll briefly describe what they are and try to give you some helpful advice in dealing with them. Let's start by looking at lectures. These are large classes, usually lasting around one hour, where a lecturer or tutor talks about a subject and the students take notes. On some courses, there can be over a 100 students in a lecture. Unfortunately, there is usually little or no opportunity to ask questions during the lecture. Lectures are usually intended to do three things. Firstly, to guide you through the course by explaining the main points of a topic. Secondly, to introduce new topics for further study or debate. And thirdly, to give you the most up-to-date information that may not be included in textbooks. So as you can see, it's essential to go to lectures. Of course, you need to take notes in lectures. Remember, you don't need to write down everything the lecturer says. Try to concentrate on the main points and important details. Most lecturers use stories, examples and even jokes to illustrate a point. And you shouldn't write these down. When you take notes in lectures, abbreviations and symbols for common words and terms can help you write faster. If there is something you don't understand, make a note to ask after the lecture or in a tutorial. Most students try to write up their notes after a lecture. It's a good idea to try to be organised. Keep your notes from your lectures in order in a file, but don't just file the notes away until your exams. Read through them regularly, as this will help you with your revision. It's really important to go over your lectures. As an international student, the lecturer will recognise that you may need more help in lectures and that you may want to record the lecture on a digital recorder. If you do want to do this, ask the lecturer's permission first. They will usually agree. Finally, don't worry if you find it difficult to understand the lecturer at first. This will get easier as you get used to their style and as your English improves. OK, that's enough about lectures. Let's have a look at seminars now. Seminars are smaller classes where students and a tutor discuss a topic and they often last about the same time, if not longer than lectures. You will know in advance what the topic is and the tutor will usually ask some students to prepare a short presentation for discussion. Seminars are usually meant to encourage debate about an issue. This means different opinions will be expressed by the tutor and students. The aim is not for students to be told the correct answer, but to understand different arguments and make judgments about them. This process helps you learn to analyse topics critically. Some international students find that seminars can be a bit frightening, especially if they're not used to this kind of teaching. Don't worry, many other students feel the same at first. Participating actively in seminars is an important part of the learning process, so try to contribute, even if it seems difficult at first. It is best to do some reading before each seminar, so that you are familiar with the topic and can follow and contribute to the discussion. It may help you to make notes before the seminar of any points you would like to make. If you are having difficulty in seminars, discuss this with your tutor. And finally, I'll give you information on tutorials. Tutorials are meetings between a tutor and an individual student or small group of students. 
These usually last between 15 and 30 minutes. In a tutorial, the tutor will give you advice and guidance on a piece of work you are doing or a piece of work you have completed, or even a problem you may be having with a topic or with study methods. You should try to ask questions during tutorials about your work or about topics raised in lectures and seminars. Well, that's all for teaching methods. I'll go on now to talk about the different kinds of examination. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Big, big,